So I'm here in New York to take a look at one of the most historical documents on the planet. An original Declaration of Independence broadside. There's probably only 20 left in private hands, and I'm about to take a look at one right now. Jeremy? Hey, Rick, yep. I'm here for the broadside. Come on in. There it is. Um, definitely a wow moment. A wow um, moment, right. This is uh, an extremely rare July 1776 printing of the Declaration of Independence. This is absolutely amazing. I mean, it's probably one of the coolest things I've ever seen in my career. I've been in this market for years, and it's a thrill to handle something like this. So the condition of this copy is truly exceptional. This was sourced from a private collection. It has never been sold at public auction and is uh, highly sought after. So yeah, this is just incredible. This was right after the 4th of July. I think it was John Dunlop was a printer in Philadelphia. He goes out and um, he basically takes a, a copy from Congress and writes it all out, then goes back to the print shop, lays out his print, and starts printing these. Uh, they think he printed right around 200 of them, OK? And that was the original one. And then when other printers around the country got a hold of them, they also made copies. And this is the New Hampshire one, correct? Correct. That's what the way the internet works back then. <laughs> I mean, you know, um, it was a little bit slower. So I mean, you know, like 10 days later, people in New Hampshire are finding out about this. Right. A week or two later, it's probably in the Carolinas. And eventually, everybody knew about it. I imagine your local tavern, when this was first penned up, there was a lot of people standing around going, damn. <laughs> this is like putting your thumb to the most powerful country in the world at the time. Yeah. And you know what's really cool about this one? You can actually see the pinholes here in the corners, which indicates that it was displayed publicly. It probably hanged for a week. Everyone would come by and look at it. Oh, you know, after a few weeks, a poster for the new band was going to be there. Um, <laughs> they were never, ever meant to be saved. Yeah. As far as documents go, it's the coolest thing I've ever seen in my career. So how much are you looking for this? This was displayed at the um, National Constitution Center in Philadelphia. Uh, it's an exceptional condition. It's extremely scarce. Two million. OK. Um, everything looks right on it. But I just want a document expert to look at it. I, sure. I have one coming down, best document guy in New York. Once he says everything's the real deal, we'll go from there. OK? OK. <sighs> because a little bit of knowledge can always get you in trouble, and that's what I got. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I believe it's worth $2 million for this, but we'll leave it up to him and see what he thinks. I'll be curious to know uh, where he lands. So here we go. Yeah, I am thrilled to see this. I'm Seth Caller, and I'm a dealer and a museum collection builder and an expert in important historic documents. Everything looks right to me, but like, um, I don't want to be 99% sure. Right. <laughs> I normally would have to take this out of the frame to authenticate it, but I've actually seen this exact copy before. Some of the things that we looked at when I first authenticated this was to compare this to all of the known copies of the same broadside. And part of what held it up, there are the nail holes from uh, back then, which are not you know, very consistent round nails like we have today. They're all handmade and different. And you can see on the handmade laid paper even the impression of individual letters. People think of the Declaration of Independence as the signed copy, but that was actually done a month later, really as a souvenir. The word had to get out by these printed documents. So there were a couple hundred printed on the night of July 4th to 5th. They're sent out by John Hancock, and the major cities where they arrive uh, reprint them. And this copy actually was posted on a wall. So you can imagine 1776, somebody walking up to it and reading about this event that changed their lives. All right, so, so I mean, it's 100% legit. Absolutely. All right. Um, brass tacks, what is it worth? This particular one is a really beautiful copy. Uh, it's just a wonderful broadside, an important relic of history. And the world changed when the first people looked at this very document. I think this could go for $2 million at auction now. That's what I want to hear, man. I will let you know what happens, man. I mean, uh, yeah. thanks for coming in. OK, thanks. Thanks. Good to see you. 
This is a fantastic, rare, earth-changing document. If Rick can purchase this, I think it would be great for him. I'd be a little jealous. All right, so he said it was, you know, it could be worth $2 million. You know, whenever you hear on the news something selling at an auction for a lot of money, that's the headline number. There is a ridiculous amount of fees. I would love to give you, like, $1.4 million. I mean, it's a fair point you make about the fees. I mean, you know, I, I know how it works. Um, I would sell it to you for $1.5 million. OK. Um, I'll meet you in the middle. Uh, 1.45, I, I think that's fair. I, I think we can both be happy with that. You know, I think uh, I think we got a deal. Uh, oh my goodness, I own the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. Uh, I will get the money wired to you. I will pick it up from you tomorrow. Um, I have a friend I want to show it to, so just keep it till tomorrow. And um, like I said, thanks again, Ben. Yeah, no, it's been a pleasure. So, you know, 1.45 million, no fees for the auctioneers, get the deal done today. I'm happy. Cue the fireworks. Chum and I are in a warehouse in Los Angeles that sells sneakers, and they actually have a pair of shoes that Michael Jordan wore in the movie Space Jam. This warehouse is full of rare sneakers, and Chum has already found some other shoes that he says we should consider buying. Now we're waiting for Chum's expert, and hopefully Chum hasn't put me in a jam on this trip. <laughs> All right, here's your guy. All right, Rick, Yeezy Buster, Yeezy Buster, Rick. I go by Yeezy Busta because I bust celebrities who wear fake Yeezys. I keep my identity hidden and wear a mask because I don't want to get sued for defamation. So what do you think? So first up, we got the Freddy Kruegers, one of the most sought after dunks ever. Do you mind if I take a closer look at them? By all means. All right, so let's see. Here we can tell that the shoes are brand new. There's no heel drag. And I mean, this is definitely an authentic pair. And they look amazing. I love this shoe. So I see you picked out the Encore Force. This is actually the remake. It's an unofficial retro. The quality is on point. The smell. What are you smelling for? The glue that actually puts the shoe together is supposed to smell a certain way. Fake factories put a different type of glue that smells very bad and very strong. So these ones actually smell right. These are definitely authentic. All right. So tell me about Yeezys. So these here are actually one of my favorites. The fact that Kanye actually wore these on tour is just incredible. This was actually supposed to be the fourth colorway of the Yeezy one, but these shoes were scrapped completely. So there's only like a couple of sample pairs in existence. All right, and uh, the Paris ones. When those released, plenty of people didn't really even care for them at the time because they didn't know their true value. So there's plenty of pairs that were just thrown on uh, electricity lines and nobody really cared about them. I mean, this shoe kind of is the shoe that at the time set skateboarding shoes on the map to be worth something more than just to skate in. What do you think they're worth? So for the Freddy Kruegers, I would price them at about 26000 The Encores, I would price them 32000 For the Fire Red or Ferrari Red Easy Sample, it's really hard to put a price on it just because there might only be one in the world. If I had to put a price on it today, I would say 150000 And now the Paris Dunks, I would price that at around $72,000. OK. Well, what do you think? I still haven't seen the Space Champ shoes. Well, we had to warm you up, Rick. You know, we had a lot of cool sneakers out here, but this is definitely the holy grail. OK, let's take a look. I've actually seen these once before, and it took my breath away. Oh, I thought a light was going to come up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Rick. Michael Jordan wore those in one of the most iconic movies ever, Space Jam. I don't think Space Jam was one of the most iconic movies ever. It had Michael Jordan and Bugs Bunny in the same movie. What's more iconic than that? So I have the Air Jordans that Michael Jordan wore in the movie Space Jam. 
After the Michael Jordan Last Dance documentary, there's been so many people contacting me that found out about me owning these sneakers. So I think I'll act like a free agent and see how it all pans out. Awesome. Where'd you get them? I got them from somebody whose uh, relative worked on the set. Apparently, MJ handed it to him. Space Jam came out in 1996, and it was a live action movie. It had Michael Jordan and some other basketball players in it, along with the Looney Tunes. Yeah, it grossed a, a ton of money. It was like over $200 million it grossed. And there's a sequel coming out with LeBron James, right? Let's just hope he does it justice. This is more than just a movie prop. This was the first time that this model was unveiled. And this was like one of the most popular Jordans ever made, the Jordan 11. So what do you think they would go for? Just the fact that Space Jam is the highest grossing basketball movie of all time. And also, The Last Dance it did come out, which made all of Michael Jordan's memorabilia just go through the roof. I can see these selling for upwards of a million dollars. Oh, there you go. I'm happy to hear that. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you coming out. Um, I'll be in LA for a few days. Maybe we can have some dinner. Sounds good. All right, I'll give you Sounds a call. Good. Thank good you. Good luck, guys. All right, Rick. I don't know enough about the sneaker business. It's too much for me. I mean, you can at least make the guy an offer. I mean, I'd offer him like 300 grand because I just don't know enough about shoes. You can't do better than that. I'm good. What about some of these other shoes? I don't want you to leave empty handed, Rick. I'm really interested in those Paris shoes. Well, let me grab them. Now, those are cool. So would you take like 55,000 for them? No. What would you take? 70 grand's a great deal. That's family love price. 60? 65. Can we meet at 62? OK. Cool. All right, deal, 62 grand. OK. And All right. I'm going to do a little bit more shopping on stuff I can actually wear. All right. I don't even know who he is anymore. I really was hoping that we might come to a deal on the Michael Jordan Space Jam shoes, but time will tell, and we'll see what happens with them. Salmon, beautiful, sunny San Diego. I guess you'd call this working. And uh, I bought some really cool beer items. So I'm here to see my buddy Peter. He owns Alesmith Brewery. He can tell me what they're worth, see if I got a good deal or not, and uh, I'm going to try and drink for free. <laughs> hey, Rick. Hey, man. Good to see you again. Me too. So I, I got two really cool items. I have this 1800s scientific instrument for measuring alcohol, and I have no idea how it works or really what, even what it's worth. Wow. Well, let, let me take a look here. All right. So we got a heating element here. Yeah, here's the alcohol burner. And this goes that. That's as far as I got. OK. <laughs> and I believe this is going to fit in here. Right. So what we have here, it's an ebulliometer. It's based on the boiling temperature of different liquids. So we know ethyl alcohol boils at about 174, and we know water boils at 212. So they scaled that out, and the more alcohol, the lower the boil temperature. OK. I would love to fire it up. I'm just concerned about the mercury in this. It's, OK. It's, but there's nerds out there that love this kind of stuff. Um, I'm one of them. The field alcohol meter isn't something you see every day. From what I can tell, it's never been used. It looks in pristine condition. And I imagine that it would dictate the dollar amount at the higher end of the spectrum. See, he's young. And... Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> the Harvard Brewing Company. I mean, it's the thickest barrel I've ever seen. You know, back in the old days, these things found their way onto ships. They were being on railroads. So uh, they were hardy. They would reuse these over and over again as well. That's what the bunghole's about. You could fill and refill, clean these. You got your keystone here. You put the tap right on there. This would obviously be on its side. And you'd dispense beer right out of here. Now, if they did get in trouble in Prohibition, and a lot of these were destroyed, so that would help the value with this. So what are these things worth? Well, your vintage field meter here, I've seen ones that are in beat-up condition that are six, 700 bucks. This is pristine. I'm not sure it was ever even used. It's a nice piece of equipment. The barrel, it comes down to pre-prohibition or post-prohibition. Based on the shape, the thickness of the wood, the way the rings are, I'm betting it's pre-prohibition. So I'm going to say together here, about 2,000 bucks. So what did you pay? I paid 1,400. Huh? You know what? And they're going to look great in my bar. They are cool. 
Now, what's interesting is barrel aging strong beer in bourbon barrels, rye barrels, tequila barrels became fashionable. And I can show you how we use those today back in the brewery. OK, this I got to see. So how many barrels do you got right now? We're pushing about 800 of these barrels. It's beer that's finished and ready for market, but we take a portion of each batch, and we can park them in here up to a year. And they're going to be everything the original beer is, but now you're adding layers of complexity, like vanilla, oak, some bourbon notes. OK, cool. I love beer, but uh, <laughs> you can leave no, it. it's also got a great history. It's what people sustained on, because yeah. you know, if you were in London back in, say, the 1600s, you would be insane to drink the water there. The beer was fine. Mm -hmm. And it goes even deeper. You know, We stopped being nomadic for the grain, for beer making, bread making. Why did Mayflower pull over on Plymouth Rock? They ran out of beer. <laughs> so I would have paid a lot more attention in school if I would known that beer touches lots of different elements of civilization. OK. So, I got a great idea. I don't know if you're up for this, but uh, how would you like to brew a batch of beer? Oh, I'd love to. I think I can make that happen. It'd be Rick's Wicked Ale? You call it what you want. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to go talk to my brewers. OK. Most people don't realize what beer has done for society. Beer was so important, the pharaohs in Egypt demanded beer in tax. The Romans had beer. All through the Middle Ages, they had beer. As a matter of fact, we had a revolutionary war because guys sat around in taverns and came up with the entire plan. Beer is proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy. I don't always get enough merchandise in the shop, so sometimes I got to go to different cities to go scout for it. And since Hollywood memorabilia always sells well, I'm in LA and I'm about to take a look at possibly the largest collection of on-screen props from Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, possibly the greatest movie ever made. I'm giddy. I got my lucky jacket on. Hey, Dan. Hey, what's up? Oh, a little bird you. told me you had some uh, Willy Wonka stuff? Yes, some props from the original film. Why, are you a fan? Yeah, the Gene Wilder Wonka, not the Johnny Depp Wonka. Right. Because it is the greatest movie ever made. Yes. Especially when I was, like, seven years old. And as far as kids' movies go, it was the one that meant the most to me. Yeah, yeah. It had an incredible following, and it has an incredible following to this day. Whenever it's on TV, I stop and watch. OK, I'll tell you what. Make a wish. Count to three, and I'll be right back. <laughs> I have this Willy Wonka collection, five pieces, five props from this original 1971 film that I know Rick will flip over. The asking price for the Willy Wonka collection is $725,000. If he wants one thing, he's going to have to pay up. Voila. Wow. Is that the hat? This is the original hat that Gene Wilder wore in the original film. Is that insane? I just have to do this? Looking pretty stylish. <laughs> <laughs> he had a small head. He did. Or I might have a fat head. <laughs> <laughs> this is the golden egg. It's heavy. OK. And a golden ticket? A genuine. Screen used, golden ticket. <sighs> and to boot, Wonka bars. Those ones that they used on the set? Yeah. And they still haven't melted. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're props made of wood. Yeah. So where'd you get all this stuff? We bought it at auction. And uh, the one big thing is that you want to make sure, obviously, it's authentic. And even with the photo matches, we wanted to know the lineage and where it came from. The crazy thing is that each one of these pieces, these props, came from Julie Dawn Cole, who played Veruca Salt. So what better can you get than from her? That's amazing. And what is that? What would you want it to be? Oh, my god. Is it the everlasting gobstopper? Yeah. That's I, the real deal? I'm even getting chills holding it. <sighs> it's like. The Hope Diamond. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about being oh. speechless. Yeah, that's like the Holy Grail. When I was seven years old, that's the one thing I remember was the everlasting gobstopper. It just sounded like the most amazing thing in the world with all the different flavors, and it lasts forever. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was the centerpiece of the whole film. So yeah, Slugworth uh, came to Charlie and you know told him he'd give him a bunch of money if he stole the everlasting gobstopper. Yeah. And at the end, Charlie turned around and just gave it back to Willy Wonka. And that's when the Willy Wonka gave the factory. Yes. It's crazy, too, because the movie was a flop. 
And then the 80s came out and video came out. It just turned into like the greatest thing ever. Like a cult classic. It's still popular to this day. So how much do you want for the cop stopper? Gosh. Um, that is the centerpiece of the film, which if we sell that, that's definitely breaking up the aesthetics of the whole collection. So um, I'm going to give you one price, and that's that. I, I got to stick with $100,000 for the Gobstopper. It was your favorite film. If you throw in a Wonka bar. So that means that I'd literally be giving you a Wonka bar. A Wonka bar. <laughs> and that's breaking up the set, though. It's not really a set. They were just, you know, it's just, it's, yeah. just Wonka bars. I mean, they're like, but. I'll tell you what, I would give you one Wonka bar, and I'd give you the Everlasting Gobstopper for 115000 But you can do it for 100000 No. All right, so $105,000, and I get a Wonka bar. I'm going to miss that Everlasting Gobstopper. Sweet! You got a deal. It's like the Fountain of Youth. I'm seven years old again. <laughs> I mean, these are crazy pricey, but putting these things in the shop will bring people in my shop. They're in amazing condition. They have all the provenance in the world. They're 100% legit. They are wanted, and these collectors pay insane money. So I'm here in Boston because my buddy Steve Gradge told me about a, this amazing Red Sox collection. And he tipped me off that the seller might actually be willing to sell a few pieces. Hey, Rick. Hey, how's it going? All right, Pat, welcome. Thanks for coming out here. Oh, thanks. We've got some amazing items here that I want to show you. OK. This is the most extraordinary and unique collection of Red Sox team signed baseballs that you're going to find anywhere on the planet. It starts from 1901, which would be this ball right here, and all the five World Series they won with Babe Ruth. And this one is the first and earliest Babe Ruth signature that we know of that's out there on a baseball. That's incredible. And we have the world's largest baseball card. <laughs> the world's largest baseball card. Don't put it in the spokes of your bike, because this one signed by Cy Young. OK. Pretty damn cool. <laughs> I'm representing the owners of the biggest team baseball collection in Red Sox history. Today, we're going to be able to offer the Cy Young cabinet card. The owners are looking to get $175,000. The other item we have is Ted Williams' 477th home run baseball. They're looking to get $50,000 for that. I mean, this is really neat. These two pieces the owners are willing to part with. This baseball is Ted Williams' 477th home run. Why don't you put that glove on right yeah. there? Yeah, I mean, he's Mr. Baseball in Boston. Oh, he wrote all over it. That's really wrote cool. All over it. Home run number 477, June 24, 1958. Yeah, I think Ted Williams was basically considered a god in this town. Oh, <laughs> still is. He was yeah. the Red Sox Mickey Mantle. And we're talking about a World War II veteran here. He missed five years of his career to go to the military and serve our country and still hit 521 home runs. This is an excellent piece. What this is is a cabinet card from 1893 signed by Cy Young. As far as we know, there's only six of these out there in the world. The best part about it is if you look over here, this actually comes in the envelope that he sent it with his handwriting. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. Yeah, it's Cy Young, who's arguably the greatest baseball player ever to live. Yeah. He's a pitcher that won over 500 games. 511. It would be mathematically impossible for any pitcher to do that nowadays, because they just they don't play that many games. So super cool collection. So gloves off. What is the price of the Ted Williams ball? Our team will accept 50000 for that ball. OK. And the world's largest baseball card. We're asking 175000 for that. OK. Uh, it's a little bit pricey. <laughs> so I'm going to go give uh, Steve a call. Just, OK. You know, I just want a little input here. Give me a few minutes. I'll be right back. I'm going to go give him a call. OK, great. So I guess you already know about this stuff. Yeah, it's some really great stuff. This is some of the best stuff I've ever seen outside of the Baseball Hall of Fame. So I really love number 477, Ted Williams. I think it's really, really cool. He's certainly still the most famous Red Sox player almost of all time. So I see we have the letter as well. 
This is from Steve Runnels. Pete Runnels was a pretty good ball player in his own right, and a former teammate of Ted's. So it says, my father Pete Runnels and Ted Williams were teammates. On June 29th, 1958, Ted Williams hit his 477th career home run. The ball was hit atop the roof in right field. Now, that's a great story. My father acquired the baseball, and he wrote the score and information about the home run on the ball, and then had Ted Williams autograph the ball. Now, I'm, you know, semi-familiar with this. You're not really gonna see much on here. It's just mostly a faded signature but you know the thing you want is that and that um which is absolutely phenomenal and then we have this cy young baseball card this is really fantastic piece of history cy young obviously you know really the greatest pitcher of all time two years after he died they named the cy young award after him but the great thing about this and i know the history about this piece is this letter is tied in directly to this so this is cy young sending this to someone and i don't know if you could ask for better provenance so what do you think they're worth you have two great pieces here rick these are museum quality so the first one obviously cy young just focusing on this how incredibly rare it is i could easily see this going for two hundred thousand dollars okay and the ball so the baseball is really interesting you know and i love the letter it ties it all in together i put that value right at sixty-five thousand. okay you want to have dinner later? If you're buying. Well, if I buy anything, I'm going to be broke, so you'll have to buy. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Good luck. OK, all right, so the ball and the Cy Young, I will give you 175 grand. For all of it. For these two right Yeah. I'm sorry, just I absolutely cannot do that. Our price is two and a quarter right now. And your best price is? My best offer? I'll give it all to you for 220. My best offer is literally going to be 180. I'm sorry, just can't do it that low. Okay, well, if you change your mind, let me know. Okay, but thanks a lot. I was disappointed that we couldn't come to an agreement on price, but we're going to hold on to them. We know there's other interested buyers out there, and we know we'll get our price eventually. We just surprised Chum with a brand new bike for his 30th birthday. Surprise! And now we're heading to the biggest motorcycle rally in the world, Sturgis. It only happens once a year, and it's in South Dakota, 1,100 miles away from Vegas. If I have to turn 30, this is the way to do it. I can't believe I fell for it when the guys told me I couldn't come. I should be plotting some type of revenge or something, but I'm having way too much fun. I'm the kind of guy that likes to just cruise and enjoy the ride, so I'm in no hurry. I'm just bummed that, you know, Rick decided to take a motor home as opposed to being out in the wind with us. I've been driving for a couple hours now, and with no one to bug me, it has been the best. Just crossed into Utah, and I pulled into a little town named Hurricane to look for some food. What do we have here? And I noticed a little antique shop with a weird trailer out front, so I'm gonna go inside and see what they got. Hello. Hey, how's it going? Good, how are you? All right, just looking around. Sure. Unfortunately, even when I'm on vacation, I can't help myself. I'm always looking for deals. One of the weird things about a random antique shop, you'll never know what you'll find. It might just be completely full of junk, might be full of treasures, might be overpriced, might be underpriced. Is the player piano for sale? Well, everything has its price. What year is it? It's 110 years old. And it works and everything like yeah. that? Yeah, here, try it. It's the hit of the store. OK. What do you think? So what would you take for it? It'd have to be more than 10000 That's a little more than I want to pay. Well, I'd be in trouble if I sold it. I'd give it to my wife for her birthday. How much do you love your wife? <laughs> A lot. OK. Well, this place has got going for it. It's pretty damn big. So there might be that one little treasure stash in the corner somewhere. This is definitely pretty cool. Excuse me. Question? Yeah, do you know anything about this? It's on consignment. I don't know anything about it. Looks like some sort of helmet. Samurai helmet, it looks like. You're asking 300 bucks for it. I probably shouldn't tell you this, but you're not asking nearly enough for this thing. He had a price for 300. I have a conscience. I believe in karma. 
I had to tell him what it was worth. Um, because it could retail for as much as 2500 bucks. Really? Yeah. Wow. I own the Ugly Trailer Antiques in Hurricane, Utah. With the Samurai helmet, I was really surprised that it was worth that much. That blew me away. I think the customer that has it on consignment will be thrilled. This is actually really cool. This is a Samurai helmet from late Edo period. When is that? Early 1600s to basically 1868, I believe, somewhere right around in there. You know, you had the emperor, who was like the king, and then you had the samurai, which was sort of like the royal court. They were basically the equivalent of like dukes and earls in England. Over the years, I've seen a few samurai helmets. I've seen a lot of samurai swords. So when you get those things in your store, you try and do a lot of research on them. That way, you know, next time they come in, what to look for. I mean, everything on this thing looks right. So how much will you take for it? What will you give me? Twelve fifty. I gotta do a little better now. You only wanted three hundred to start with. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what will you take for it? Well, I think after what I've learned about it today, I think we gotta have at least two for it. Um, Fifteen hundred. Uh, come on, you can do better than that. Seventeen. I'll go sixteen. Sixteen fifty. All right, 1650. All right. Let's go write it up. Usually I say that. <laughs> <laughs> Just goes to show when you go into an antique store in a small town, every once in a while you can find something. I think I can sell it quick. Sturgis, here I come. What's up, Pops? Chum, you can take your shoes off my desk. Thank you. Well, my fire truck is done, and I have this great idea. Let's ride motorcycles from Vegas to Oregon. So this is actually happening. Yes, I'm actually getting my fire truck. He's restored it. It's going to be up there in a few days. Let's take the bikes. Let's make this an adventure. I mean, just think about it. Yeah, I'll ride motorcycles to Oregon with you anytime. We take off from here, cruise up and down the 101. Wait, do you have a bike I could use? Because I sold the one you gave me. Yes, you can use one of my bikes. Now listen, OK? No, this is, think about it. This could be a just great Just so you week. know, both my bikes are down right now. I'm going to need to borrow a bike, too. OK, you guys can use some of my bikes. Monday morning, leave the pawn shop, 1,000 miles to Oregon. Perfect. OK, cool. It's going to be a ball. What a ride, Rick. I can't believe I made it up here on a 650. It's a lot nicer than I remember it, Rick. You did some work. Looks yeah, really good. Yeah, a lot of work. You guys want to go on the Grand Tour? Does it bear in the woods? Shotgun. No, nah, Chum, you're still in the back, dude. So I brought Corey and Chum up to my place in the mountains, which is in the middle of nowhere and completely off the grid. Literally, if there was a zombie apocalypse, I wouldn't even know about it. So this is the powerhouse. This is what makes us completely off the grid. You did all this? Yeah, this is basic electronics. This pipe right here goes to my upper pond. Water goes through there, gains velocity, spins this pulley right here, which excites my two alternators. Then the power goes into my charge controller right there, which charges the batteries. And then that sends power over here to my breakers for everything. So basically, you got a miniature Hoover Dam, right? Yeah. What I got here is 80 acres of old growth forest. I love being in the mountains, and I love to work with my hands. My dad made me start working construction when I was 12 years old, so I basically can fix anything myself. So here's the workshop. This is pretty sweet. All right. So what kind of stuff do you have to build in here? Well, it's everything. It's like things break. I have to fix things. I got to work on my tractors, my razors, my everything else like that. Sometimes I got to make my own parts. The turbine was made in the 1950s, so there's no parts for it. So whenever there's something's wrong with that, I have to mill my own parts. And then you have to make your own parts to fix the turbine? Yeah, because they don't make parts for it anymore. So you're just off the grid building turbines now? I mean, once you understand the physics and the theory, you know, the rest of it's not that hard. OK, well, let's go see more of the property. Let me go show you the well. And see this right here? That's our well. It's where I get all my water. But the great thing about that, it's up right here on the top of the mountain, so everything's gravity fed downhill, so I don't need a water pump or anything, so it's less power I got to use. How much water does it hold? I think it holds 5,000 gallons. Good, because I like to take a lot of baths. <sighs> all right, let me show you the rest of the property. 
This is what I love, just living off the grid and doing everything myself. I basically have everything here except one thing, a fire truck. And I'm getting that soon. <laughs> really? We please stop playing with that. The truck's coming. The fire truck's coming? Yeah. Turn it off, please. There it is. Oh, that is sweet. Please! Okay. I can't hear you. Will you. Could you please? I'm gonna look at, I'm gonna go look at my fire truck. Oh, that is cool. That's amazing. Look at oh. that. Look at that. That is pretty cool. Dad, you are now officially the biggest kid I know. <laughs> Most kids want a fire engine for Christmas. You actually bought yourself a real fire engine. All aboard! <laughs> Dude, it looks great. What up, everybody? <laughs> Man. It looks amazing, dude. Absolutely amazing. Me and my sons, we put a lot of love into it for you, Rick. Before, this thing was ugly old neon yellow. Yeah. We cleaned all that up. We sanded this whole thing down. We needed to address all the sheet metal issues. There was a hole in the front of the grill. There was other holes that we needed to cover up. They had just put metal plates over. The hood was welded on, which was really crazy. So we fixed all of those issues. And then we got into the wiring. We definitely had to have all the lights working and all the chrome that was on it, we polished up. It's absolutely amazing. Great, Dad, I'm glad you got yourself a little toy. It's not a toy, this is serious equipment. Dad, if there's a fire, please call 911. I am the fire department, right, Chum? Yeah, and I'm a deputy. You guys look like a great team. <laughs> oh, you polished up the siren, the most important part. This siren was a nightmare. But we took it upon ourselves to figure this thing out and get it fixed. In the interior, remember we had that ugly old ratty brown seat. We yeah. had all the other stuff in there. We got rid of all that. We got leather on leather, black on black. We got everything cleaned up, all the dash, redid all the switches, redid all the wiring. Dude, it looks incredible. Um, it really does. But one of the things that we got in here, which is just a little gift for you guys, because you guys are going to be firefighters as well. <laughs> And that's yours, Mr. These are the best part of the whole truck. <laughs> but the main thing me and my sons were trying to do, Rick, was just keep the vintage look that it had. Dude, it's, it's great. So how much I owe you? Well, we had a few more issues than we kind of thought about. So we were kind of a little bit over. OK. Predicted. What's a little bit over? 27200 Well, that's not bad at all. I paid 5000 for it. That makes me $32,000, the world's greatest toy. Well, let me go get you paid and find you a flight back. Awesome. It's a fire drill. Let's go. If there's a fire at your warehouse, and we don't have any time to spare. We got to go. We got to hustle. Let's, let's, let's go. go. Hey, you guys get on the back. Let's go. Come on. We got a fire to put out. Hustle, bustle, let's go. Get it out, come on. Hustle, hustle, Rick. Over the hill, go. Yeah! We did it! <laughs> we did it, Rick! Okay, let me see this. This is the best thing in the world. I'm a fire chief. And you're a deputy. Damn right I am. And Corey's an apprentice. He doesn't even have his hat on. Amazing, dude. This thing is absolutely did. great. And you know what? When I'm not putting out fires, I have a mobile car wash. Make some <laughs> extra money on the side.